All right. A Whitney Shea, welcome to Green Pill. First question, do you take the green pill and when? Every day. It doesn't matter. It has to be every day, though. Got to get it in there. Every day. That's the spirit. 365. Whitney has a practice called Mindful Vision Counseling. Her and some other counselors and therapists support spouses of folks who are in the military. They also do some holistic treatment and they also do typical psychotherapy on ranging from depression, anxiety. They use modalities like EMDR, even really more holistic modalities. So quite a wide ranging dialogue today, but I know we'll focus especially on supporting someone in the military and the spouses there. Her practice serves people in Arizona, Connecticut, Florida, Nevada, South Carolina, Texas, and wait for it, the United Kingdom. Quite a wide range here. Whitney also is an adjunct professor at William Peace University and has started her career working at the Cerebral Palsy Center in New York City. Quite a wide ranging breadth of experience and interesting dialogue today, so welcome. And so what got you started in back in 02, even a little bit before then, what got you into this field? I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I ended up getting married to an active duty Marine right after I received my graduate degree in psychology. So where I thought I might go was not actually what happened. There was a lot of backstory, but basically when you are a spouse in the military or a family member of the military or certainly the, the military person themselves, there's a lot of moving in general. One thing about being a counselor and many other fields as well, social work, marriage and family therapists, lots of psychologists, in the United States, every single state has different rules and different licensures. I had made the decision that I was going to, instead of getting licensed in the state in which we lived at the time, because I knew we'd be moving that very next year, and the expense, the resources, the energy, everything that it takes to, to make that happen, not to mention, oh, now I have to secure a position, and then I need to tell them I'm gonna be leaving in six months, and that was just a really a tough thing to do for me, but also for any employer who would want to have me come on. Right after we got married, believe it or not, I found out I was pregnant, and so, that came into play as well. Our daughter was born 10 weeks early. So she was three pounds, seven ounces and came wow. a couple months early. So wow. that was another reason that I thought I really, I need to find something where I'm going to be home to be able, and I'm very blessed that I was able to do that. So all of those things to say that I ended up at that time as an adjunct professor at the inception, really, our daughter's almost 20. So at the inception of online programs, and that was way up in Massachusetts, that I did that. And I did that for years because it was something that I could hold on to and keep current. It was an asynchronous situation. So I was able to even be in different time zones. We lived in Japan for several years and I was able to continue on with that work. So um, that was a really long answer to your question about how I got into it. But basically it mm -hmm. was family, um, the needs of the Marine Corps and the parameters that we had um, being a part of that establishment. And also just my real desire to be able to be flexible and be home. And so you were remote before it was cool. <laughs> Definitely. Like before our, it was cool. Like, wait, yeah. How do you teach in Massachusetts and you live in North Carolina? So yes, I was really lucky. And so you, you've been navigating this system of regulations and certifications with the clinicians on your team too. And, and you folks focus on spouses of military members, specifically those on active duty and when and your team know the challenges therein, which include moving, which include uprooting your life, adjusting, reestablishing routines, which you and I touched on. You, is that what made you become a therapist in the first place? Like trying to help people with their personal lives or was it more of a bent because of something childhood or family? Like what inspired you to actually become a counselor and a therapist in the first place? That's a great, that's a great question. And I would have to answer all of those things. I started my undergrad thinking, oh, I think I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to do that in elementary mm -hmm. education. And then it just, the classes that I took, I was kind of like, I don't think this is going to be a good fit for me long-term. And, but the classes that I did really enjoy were psychology, sociology. And so that sort of started me into that trajectory. But at the same time, I have 
whole history of whether it's family members, I've gone through my own things emotionally, mentally, some struggles uh, in my teen years, in my early 20s. So I think that all came into play in figuring out that was what I wanted to do. And then when we finally got our the opportunity to do our practicum and internship, I was able to meet with people face to face, figured out that it really was a really good fit for me you know, mm-hmm. to be able to help on that level. And so it really clicked for you and there was no looking back. And then you became a professor early on in your journey. I did. I did. And that's the funny part. I, you just never know. And so that was never the plan. It just turned out that way. And I really, I wanted to work, but I wanted to be flexible and part-time, as I mentioned before, and that was the perfect way for me to do that. So I continue, gosh, it's literally almost been 20 years that I've been doing Mm -hmm. this, but at the time, that was all I was doing. I was not Mm -hmm. a counselor, I Mm -hmm. had my degree, and I had taken the the exams that you need to take in order to apply for licensure, but I never actually went through with that until COVID, the COVID time frame, actually, we were stationed in Bucharest, Romania, and came back to Connecticut to visit some family. And I just said, I think this is the time. It was like the perfect storm of, okay, this is the norm now. We're doing things online. This It's much mm-hmm. more accepted. And so I really, it's only been about three years, just over three years that I've had the practice and been working mm-hmm. on this level. And so the private practice is three years old. The professorship is almost 20. And then Mindful Vision Counseling could you tell us a bit, how old is Mindful Vision Counseling and how did you get so, that all together? Yeah. yeah. I'm happy to. So Mindful Vision Counseling, that's the, that is three years old. So mm-hmm. what I started to myself thinking, okay, we're across the pond there. I'm, mm-hmm. I'd still love to do this. So instead of working for someone else, I think I'll just start my own practice and do it on my own. And what I realized and was reminded was how very difficult it is for for military spouses to be able to, number one, find a position Mm -hmm. in the mental health field where they can see clients who are residing in states in which they're licensed, but at the same time, like I mentioned before, stay current and be able to to change duty stations and continue on with clients that they've worked with before. And just the licensing and just all of those things that are are really stressful and anxiety provoking for us ourselves. I thought if I've gone through all of this and I've learned so much, uh, why would I not share that? So Mm -hmm. I just went straight in to, instead of having um, a solo private practice, I Mm -hmm. brought on my first clinician within a month of opening Mindful Vision Counseling, and it's just sort of been been a trip ever since, for sure. And, and so the majority of your clients, or Mindful Vision's clients, are spouses of active duty military, is that right? So it started out as, that was my goal, right? That was my mm-hmm. vision, that was my heart, to serve mm-hmm. of course. those who serve as clinicians in their positions. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just military spouses, but also veterans, um, and That is how we started the first couple of years. It worked well. And then I started getting a lot of people interested to come join the practice who may have had different connections to the military. Like they weren't necessarily a military spouse and they they weren't a veteran themselves, but either they really respected those people or they had some other connection. And I, as I'm reading through resumes, I'm like, these Mm -hmm. are some fantastic people. (laughs) And so to leave out an entire rest of the population who might not have this one specific characteristic, we have brought on a couple of people who, like I said, have had different connections to the military and it's worked really well. And they can communicate with your clients who are involved in the military or married to someone who is. And are your clients all themselves clinicians or you're getting kind of normal folks too? So basically what I feel like my role right now, and it's definitely mm-hmm. morphed, it's changed a little bit, but so mm-hmm. I have my own clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, cool. Uh, some of them have military ties, some of them don't. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I really like to uh, focus on teens and college aged population. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of Mindful Vision Counseling and the wonderful clinicians that we have is that we have so many different specialties. A military spouse, or someone who is not a military spouse might come in with a specific issue, OCD or an eating disorder, or literally just a perfectionism and it's too Mm -hmm. much and they need someone to help. So I am the person who does like an intake and sees what the need is. And then I try to do my best to fit them with the best clinician that I feel will serve their needs best, Mm -hmm. I guess Mm -hmm. I should say. 
Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, I do see my own clients, uh, but a mm-hmm. lot of what I do now is that intake, finding out what people need and fitting. Them. I see you're almost like the quarterback distributing different. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I'll go with that. Sure. Okay. Awesome. We can do a different, any other reference that I don't, not so much a soccer guy, but so you're playing, let's just say you're playing quarterback and you, you brought on different folks and just in the span of three years. And I guess today we could touch on what it's like to be a military associated person, whether it be spouse or otherwise, and the struggles, some of which we touched on. We could also touch on what makes you like to see teens and adolescents and early adults, like what what gets you jazzed about that in your private practice and about helping those folks? Yeah, gosh, those are all such good questions. I've been married 20 years. The military is a huge part of that because it just is, right? And the people Mm -hmm. that I've met have become closer than family sometimes when you don't have that family around. So Mm -hmm. being the person, the friend, the, the neighbor who hears about struggles and also being one who's gone through many of them myself, I'm able to relate fairly well. And I know that there's a huge need. There's still a huge need for specialties, especially, I think for military people and families, the kids, the teens, the moving so much, it's a lot. And I think that might Mm -hmm. kind of segue into my, why I really enjoy working with teens and college aged individuals is that it's tough. It's really hard. And if you can relate to something specific like the transitions that they needed to make and really give them a a sense of, oh, I haven't just read about this in a book, but I understand and I've I've gone through it myself. And I, I like to support them because it really, it matters. It matters for the rest of their lives. It matters for their, their partnerships in the future, for them as parents, how well they relate to the struggles that they've gone through. So I hope that answered your question. No, it was a nice segue because they they move around so much or relocating or changing friends or you know maybe the one of their parents not being there as often physically and so what do they come to you with is it typical stuff just with that flavor folks who are what they call military brats i don't know if you you would use that word to be honest is that not pc i don't know (laughs) and i do want to say too like it doesn't it's not just about the military kids and i think that brought me into okay why really enjoy being with them but we all have our struggles we all have Mm -hmm. transitions we all have hurdles that we need to get over not go around so i really Mm -hmm. like to be able to to help uh, people do that was there a second part to your question now because i didn't know if i missed that. well um yeah i guess what comes your way is it typical stuff for your private practice who do you assign who do you throw the pass to yourself as a quarterback when do you Um, say you know what i'm going to take this one this is near and dear to my heart is that uh, also it's really starting to be the nutrition piece, the, mm. the, the the wellness piece of how very important it is to take care of ourselves holistically. That for me personally, in the last six months to a year, that has really become my focus. Uh, as far as other things, it, it's mostly just a lot of like anxiety and um, a lot of also we have a, a couple of our counselors are marriage therapists. So mm-hmm. There's a lot of couples and I definitely want to iterate that it's a lot of people think if I'm going to go to couples counseling or even individual, I have to be on my last legs. I has to be like rock <laughs> bottom. There's nothing further, couldn't be further from, from the truth. It's almost like when we talk about foods and um, nutrition and sleep and exercise, preventing an issue as opposed to treating it. So mm-hmm. I feel that I would love to just shout out how important it is that if you're feeling that way or if you know someone that is feeling maybe a little iffy or having trouble with communication there are ways to deal with that before it gets worse how do you what's your template for let me ask this in a simple way if you if i know someone that's struggling with communication and they're you see they're having some challenges how do i offer them or prompt to them or give them the idea that therapy is okay now and yeah and we've been really lucky that has changed the the perspective Mm. uh, around mental health has changed and emotional health for me uh, i would probably recommend just saying going with your own experiences if you have had an experience with a therapist or even if it's been a, a while maybe just stating that fact that i was i was really hesitant to reach out for help but once i did I can't imagine not having done that or maybe listing ways that you learn like some tools or techniques that are really practical that you utilize and that actually do help you on a daily basis. 
Mm -hmm. So certainly don't say, you need to go to therapy because X, Y, Z, but really this has helped me. I recommend that depending on the person, <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. Cause it's always something I've explored on this podcast where it's, how do you see someone struggling and offer help without pushing the boundaries? And yeah, especially personalities who are a little more restricted and they feel like they have everything together. How do you offer them some support without offending them in a way? And your template, one of them is just speak about personal experience. I do think so. And, and that's everyone is so different and their responses and reactivity to things are very different as well. I think knowing that person and, mm -hmm. and how they are is just the best first way to, to mm -hmm. kind of decide how you'd like to move forward. Like I said before, it, it's gotten much easier to be able to feel that mental health, behavioral health, emotional health, it's just, it's accepted, it's important, it's a part of mm -hmm. your longevity, whether it's long term or short term. It's really cool to see from someone who's been doing it since the time when it wasn't uh, probably as accepted when you first started out. Um, or is it true that I'm just jumping around a little bit here that the military consists of more men than women? Is that the case or is, am I incorrect there? Yes, that is, that is definitely still the case. It's more, there are much more, many more females than there ever have. Yeah. Does that mean that your practice then, if we go with like a, a typical gender role, then are you, is your practice seeing more women who have guys in the military, their husbands or their partners? Is that broadly speaking the case? I would say it's probably about half and half. It's about half and it, half. It really mm -hmm. is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that since we do also serve, I mean, we, we serve everyone, um, mm -hmm. but we serve military families, not just the military person. spouse. Right. So, and, and the need for that support is definitely there. So whether they're kids who are reaching out, teens, spouses, mm -hmm. male or female, gender, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. They need help. So we are happy to assist in any way that, that we can. But yes, I'd say probably about 50-50. I was just curious because I, I wondered if certain folks in the military would have different issues arising than the general population. And of course, the moving around is a big one. Are there any other ones that you'd want to touch on for folks listening who might be interested in working with you or someone at Mindful Vision, like what are folks going through in the military or, or military, what are military families going through? And I think that also depends upon whether it's more of a couple situation where, where it's like a, um, a second or third order effect of maybe a diagnosis that one of the partners has. For instance, uh. PTSD uh, runs rampant, unfortunately. It's just part of the, it's just part of the job unfortunately sometimes with the experiences that these individuals have had of course that's going to run off into spouse family and so we do try to support a lot of whether it's individual couples or the kids of, of the families who have had to go through this hmm. do do you want to dive into that one more on ptsd and and how you what tools what modalities how it looks there for folks or Sure. And so I go back to all the time how different everyone is and how individual mm -hmm. everyone is. And something like EMDR, the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, can really help people who are suffering with trauma. And I go back again. So it's yeah. not just PTSD from like a military experience. It could be sexual assault or something that has happened that has nothing to do with their, their time in the military. But it's sometimes talk therapy does wonders. It's sometimes just really doing a motivational interviewing or a narrative therapy where we can just get it all out there and discuss things in a safe place and kind of maybe unpack a little bit more about why they're feeling that way. Is it connected to something that may have happened when they were younger or just a reaction that they have because of the way that they were brought up or the rules in your home when you, when you grew up. It's just, there are such a plethora of possibilities for where these issues and diagnoses stem from. But it's, we, I usually do start like in a general way, like just with the discussing things. And then as we move forward, we're able to maybe have a little bit more of a, a specialty when it comes to, like I was saying, EMDR or different kinds of therapies, immersive therapy, things that will work after having known the client better. It's a mm -hmm. hard thing to just decipher within the first few appointments for sure. Mm -hmm. And so you're definitely on a longer term journey with a client and definitely hear that individual and personal theme coming out quite a bit. Sometimes. And sometimes it is something where it is a, an easier fix than you would think. 
mm-hmm. and or a more quick or more quick fix. Yeah, I mean sometimes it is right, and that's a blessing if so. And so, does the holistic angle come into play like throughout your therapy and and how you advise other practice members or how you collaborate with them? Does it come out on day one where you're asking people about food, about sleep, about exercise. I'm not sure what else you asked them about. I know you and I talked about the fasting method and the sugar regulation. How do you pair that in with what's known as traditional psychotherapy, especially since you're an adjunct professor in in Psych 101, as you say? Yeah, and things have been changing with that too. To answer your question about, do I start from day one with those Mm -hmm. types of things? In my intake paperwork, I do include nice. sleep, exercise, food, nutri- have you ever had any trouble with an eating disorder or something like that where it can be a different sort of a situation. But I am finding, and I don't know if you found this yourself, Alex, but that 90 to 95% of people that I share these questions with really don't see the connection or think it's important enough to be able to be to actually commit to a daily um, routine of just healthy non-processed foods getting your body moving and how important sleep is hydration things like that it's a struggle i am working on it but at the same time it's that sort of i don't think people don't care i think they Mm -hmm. don't know and I, i try to balance that sort of psychoeducation with understanding and empathy that like, for instance, I when I was in grad school, I worked in a restaurant and I mm-hmm. literally, I drank diet soda all day. So I'm not judging anyone, trust me, mm-hmm. but how did I not know how unhealthy mm-hmm. that was? But mm-hmm. so there's never a judgment. It's more of just, I am here, I want to help. I've learned some things, you know, let's talk about them. And that comes across, even if people are kind of don't really get it, but they'll hear you. They don't typically push back. And I see a lot of patience in your approach because for me, tabling that is is difficult. And I guess to answer your question, I, I guess the folks who've come to see me typically opt in almost to to treat their whole body uh, and a bit of their mind. Although therapists such as yourself send me patients sometimes and they're really like don't even know what I do. And they just get on a call with me because their therapist suggested it. And it does take some education and and some cueing, some motivational interviewing, like you said. And you, what I like is that you ask about it up front in the intake and, and not just eating disorder, but like, how are you sleeping, etc. Some people are convinced by data, right? Some people are convinced by personal experience, like you sharing your own personal experience. Are there, it's tough, are there any other ways you get people on board the health train? If they're they're they bought a ticket, but they're not sure if they want to punch it. So people who don't want to get on the train, they tell you that. But that happens. Ha- that happens a lot. And just like I was saying before about being able to relate mm-hmm. because of experience, mm-hmm. I feel that way because I've gone through that. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's wrong with me. I have anxiety. I can't focus. I can't sleep well. I, I experienced a lot of these things myself, and okay. finally understanding the connection, like on a true level right not just oh you should eat healthily but no like all of the things that are in our foods are traditional meats and you just all of it like in the toxins that build up in our bodies it's it to answer your question i like to share about my own experience and how mm-hmm. these types of things have helped me personally mm-hmm. and especially and we talked a little bit before the podcast or the other uh, week about how important for women like hormones are just different times of the month where you might feel a certain way or want to eat something that's there are reasons for all of these things and so Mm -hmm. i when it comes to something like that i try to also share my own experience especially for those of us who are pre-menopausal post-menopausal where you're like i don't know what's happening Mm -hmm. and i think that the medical establishment unfortunately has done women a disservice i don't think that we are educated enough even girls who are starting teenagers who just have no idea about what's going on with their bodies and how hormones affect you mentally, emotionally, physically. So uh, that is also a big part of what I'm hoping to incorporate more and more in my practice. And we can certainly talk about that for, for women, especially young girls or women going through menopause, it's so many changes. And if you can be a resource for them, but it might just do 75% of the mental health work that you're trying to do is help them just understand their body and the week before menstruation it's just they're going to feel down they're going to feel lousy they're going to feel probably tired and a little bit stressed so knowing that's coming seems it can do a lot for someone who's struggling with mood and there's a reason 
good at it. It's not just that you're lazy and you right. sit on the couch eating ice cream, watching Netflix for four hours. There's a reason behind that. Super interesting. I find it so hard with our country with almost, I think, 50% obesity rates or you know, 43% as of 2020. And it's not folks' fault. It is really the food, I would say, as a broad brush. But then I wonder, with military families especially moving around a lot, it's hard to establish a routine around what you eat and where you buy stuff. Can you go to the farmer's market? And also travel, light interruption, the anxiety around moving. Do you have any go-tos around food, around sleep, around exercise that you tell people? I think it's getting better. I think it's getting easier, especially for those who are, like you said, most of some of your most of your clients who are calling you are already in the game or like they're ready to move forward and, and know what they need to do. So just having great podcasts like yours and YouTube channels where you can find these resources. Mm -hmm. That's really how I started. I was interested mm -hmm. in my own struggles. And when I mm -hmm. look all these things up and learn all of these things, of course, I want to share them. I'm no expert yet mm -hmm. on, on all the hormonal effects of, of mental health and things like that but I'm learning. So I think that I would encourage, encourage people, whether they're military people moving all the time or just people who are busy and don't know hmm. there's so much out there these days. It's overwhelming. Yes. So just being able to Google or go on YouTube and like for me, Dr. Mindy Peltz was a mm -hmm. really great, she, I consider an expert on the hormones and fasting and she just wrote a book called Fast Like a Girl. So it's definitely very relatable and it's very practical. So I like to have resources like that mm -hmm. where I can share with people and say, check this out. And there are different YouTube videos, for example. So if you want to look into something, if you have, let's see, a specific issue that is really that you're struggling with, like PCOS, uh, polycystic mm -hmm. ovarian syndrome, a lot of women struggle from that. And doctors, for the most part have not really let them know the reasoning behind why that happens your adrenal glands and like testosterone and like all these things that you can do your yourself that don't cost any money that mm -hmm. can help so that's what i generally try to do i have my resources my go -tos, mm -hmm. and then if i can say specify exactly what you're looking to do in this realm and see and come back to me and see what you and will you um, pcos big one because i think it's 20 percent of women have it and like a lot of these things like fasting doctors just aren't up to date on and uh, so you encourage people to learn for themselves because teach a woman to fish than, rather than give them a fish. And do you ever keep folks accountable week to week? Do you, do you be like, hey, did you look up that thing around sleep? How's your sleep been? How do you do that mindfully? I do with, because I always, I almost always with clients try to have some sort of homework. Um, oh, yeah. And hmm. at the same, I realize everyone's busy. I realize, like, I always say, I don't want this to be a stress to you, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, I have my appointment and in an hour and mm -hmm. I haven't done that and have that cause you stress. Let's look at it from a different perspective so that we are actually sure we're moving forward. We're not just talking about the same thing every week. So yes, I do try to give that every week, give a little something different, and then we'll see what the pushback is if there's any, and then I shift at the time to see, because I'd much rather slow down then have us come to a complete halt and not be able to help. If you push too hard, people just come to therapy to feel better not to not to have home, not too much homework, but right. I think I, I like how you put it. Like it's not required and don't feel bad. Just come anyway. And if you can get this done, great. Or if you have time to look into it. And I think it's a nice nudge without being, without being too traditional because too traditional talk therapy that maybe folks know about is just, okay, we come, we talk, that's it. Goodbye. See you next week. And I think it's interesting to me and why I think your site caught my attention was the mindful piece and we need to be holistic with our health. So. That's right. my soapbox. I mean, you it's not just we meet for an hour every week and then it's in this little box, right? It's yeah. It's in this little space. And, and no, you have to relate it to your life and, and to your daily activities and to your relationships and, and all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's coming down the pipe. Things are changing. Times are changing, as you said. And I'm glad for our country that and for people that mental health is destigmatized, as you were saying, and especially around the military and just overall self-care is destigmatized but that 99 or 95 percent number you cited is high and I, th I consider it my mission to evangelize about holistic lifestyle and just overall like your anxiety could be much improved by changing how you eat how you sleep and how you move in the sunlight you get and the timing of each of those and if you could get 50 percent reduction in your anxiety you could feel like 
decent every day if you were able to just go on a little walk and stop eating processed foods and sleep 30 minutes more and not have your phone next to your bed but instead have it in the kitchen and these little things could make it such that you don't even need pharmacology and plus the support of a therapist and or a coach because I think doing things alone is another soapbox I stand on it's I used to think oh we can do things alone but when you're a kid you have a guidance counselor you have a coach at school you have a parent or two you have a teacher you have your friends you have you have everybody supporting you with this network and we become adults and sometimes we move around and life gets hard and you don't really have these sources of accountability or validation or support and so i think therapy is a great way to do it coaching is good too whatever it takes but i think reminding people about some of the easier wins in life like some of which you suggested is good and then some of the more advanced ones like fasting and taking care of inflammation and pcos hormones and menopause it might be a little more advanced but that might be the only thing to focus on with somebody and if they can crack that nut then Wow. Right. So really cool. Whitney, is there anything else you'd like to get out there to the world? Any any uh, message you'd like to send out there to those listening and, and those who might hear this? You know, I think the biggest idea that I would love to share with people is just to be open-minded, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. nothing to do with something else, especially when we're talking about whether it's just eating better or getting more sleep or more sunlight, right? When you wake up in the morning and just the Mm -hmm. importance of the sun on your skin like Mm -hmm. it's keep an open mind and then you know what see what feels comfortable to you even if it's in a very small way commit to it for a certain amount of time and see how you feel right you don't need to listen Mm -hmm. to us uh, but shape Mm -hmm. that in the way that can help you help your loved one it's it can't hurt right like hopefully it can only make things better so i would always just say Mm -hmm. keep an open mind do your research do your own research don't listen to alex necessarily don't Mm -hmm. listen to me only you know do your own research and then um, we're here to help if you need assistance that's my life goal one of my biggest life goals is to just be there and be able to help people feel better look better when you eat or you're eating better and you're hydrating and you're exercising and you're getting sun and you're feeling better about yourself you look better you feel Mm -hmm. even younger and there's so it's not just about feeling better but that is most important no i I like to look better i think so cool right yeah, I mean, so like, central to I mean, I'm yeah 50, I'm like, be oh, honest guy, about I, it I yeah look a little younger i won't i won't toss that aside <laughs> no comment but i think <laughs> that's a must resonate with folks out there and i think you're doing some of the right things thank you so, I, the so look better message is good too thank you i give you a lot of credit because it's, it's so important and i'm hoping it'll be the way of the future where this will be mm. the first step that people take Mm -hmm. is to do these things and then of course there are times when medications and prescriptions and pharmaceuticals are necessary absolutely but if we can make this the first stop that would be wonderful i love it thank you i hope so too and we're working on it so where can people find you could you just tell us your website and any socials and then i'll also link them in the description Sure, sure. So basically, mindfulvisioncounseling.com is where we are. Cool. And I know sometimes it's a lot to give out social media handles. So yeah. everything's yeah. on there. You can find awesome. um, our Facebook, YouTube, Instagram on there, phone number. There's even a, a booking tab where if you're interested, you can just send something in. It's a contact form and we can get in touch. Perfect. And that's Arizona, Connecticut, Florida, Nevada, South Carolina, Texas, and the UK. So people will find you there. All right. Hey, Whitney Shea, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the green pill. Keep taking it. (laughs) 